Let us pray together. Loving God, draw near to us once more. Open our hearts to your message. Open our lives to your grace. And open our spirits to receive your spirit, that all we do might ever be to your glory. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So you've just heard the familiar story from the Gospel of Luke about the angel's visit to Mary. And it's all quite active, this encounter, engagement, conversation, and recommittal. And so there's a spirit of activity that's at the heart of Christmas. Well, as we continue through the season of Advent, and we continue to look at the theme of God becoming flesh in Christ, we have another reading from the New Testament, this time from Paul's letter to the people of the Colossian church. So from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, listen to this word from the Lord. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in Christ, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 175 years ago, Henry David Thoreau went out into the woods surrounding Concord, Massachusetts, near the waters of Walden Pond. And he built a cabin there. And in his famous journal about his life there near Walden, Thoreau said this, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to confront only the essential facts of life and see if I could learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Thoreau knew that life is precious and often too short, and that's why he wished to study it and live it as deliberately as possible. Now, in this COVID season of isolation and self-reflection, we could do worse than to take Thoreau as a mentor. For we, too, have been forced to stop many of the social activities that used to fill up our days until now. Now, hopefully, our houses and apartments are a little bit more spacious than the 10 by 15 foot handmade cabin that Thoreau lived in. But having more living space doesn't automatically make our isolation any easier. The past months have forced us to, to boil down life to its essentials and in our more reflective moments to wonder, well, just what does it take to lead a meaningful life? As I said earlier, this is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Every week we've reflected on one central doctrine of our faith, the incarnation of God in Christ. Now, so far, we've looked at this doctrine from three different sources in the Bible. From John 1, where it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. From Philippians 2, in which Paul wrote, though Christ was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, being born in human likeness. And then last week, we heard a reading from Luke chapter 3, in which there was this lengthy genealogy relating Jesus through human ancestors all the way back to where it was said he was the son of Adam, the son of God. These are three different approaches to talk about Christ and the Incarnation. There's a philosophical approach, the Word became flesh. 
There's a psychological approach. Christ did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself. And then there is a biological approach. Christ, the son of Adam, the son of God. But just now, we heard a fourth description of the Incarnation, and it is a practical approach from Colossians 2. When Paul says, In Christ, the whole fullness of God dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in Him, so continue to live in Him, rooted and built up and established in the faith just as you were taught. Now, all of that is good, practical advice. Like Thoreau, it reflects a desire to live deliberately, to trust that in which you've been taught, to trust what you've come to believe about Jesus, and then live each day according to that good news. To trust in Jesus, the Christmas child born in a manger, Jesus, the Word made flesh. Jesus, the one who left heaven to dwell among us. Jesus, the son of David, the son of Adam, the son of God. See, all of that makes up the tradition we've inherited from the ancestors of our faith. But if we're honest, sometimes it's hard to just blindly accept traditions and to accept them on faith alone. I want to share an amusing anecdote to illustrate this point. A new commander was assigned to lead an army barracks base. And when he was inspecting the place, he noticed that there were two soldiers guarding a bench. And so he went over there and he asked them why they were there. And the soldier said, sir, we don't know. The last commander told us to do so, and so we did. I think it's some sort of regimental tradition. So the new commander dug up the phone number for his predecessor and asked him, why do you need men to guard a particular bench? And the man said, you know, I really don't know. The previous commander kept guards there, so I assumed it was just some sort of tradition. So going back three commanders, this new officer finally found a 99-year-old general. And so he called him up and he said, excuse me, sir, But I'm now the CO of the camp you commanded 65 years ago. I found two men assigned to a bench. Can you tell me more about this bench? To which the old officer replied, What? Is the paint still wet? I'm afraid church traditions have a lot in common with military traditions. Every time we preach about Jesus... We talk about him as this one born in Bethlehem long ago. We sing carols about him. We send out Christmas cards about him. For 2,000 years, we've recited the Apostles' Creed saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And we do all this almost automatically without thinking. But how do we move from just rote repetition of a tradition to living faith? How do we get from just saying the words Jesus Christ to deliberately living a life in Christ, rooted, built up, grounded in the actual figure of the historical Jesus? Well, if you'll indulge me to answer those questions, we actually need to go back long before Jesus to a wise Greek philosopher named Anaximander, Anaximander lived in the 6th century BC, and he too wanted to look at the world and live deliberately based on what he saw. But he soon recognized that the world is not made up of a bunch of static things, but rather of things that are always changing and evolving. He recognized a cloud is not a thing. A cloud is made up of ever-shifting water particles that are condensed and blown about in the sky. A wave is not a thing, but it is the moving and ever-shifting water as it races to the shore and back. A storm is not a single thing, but a collection of meteorological events. A war is not one thing, but a sequence of military events. A family is not a static thing, 
but it's an evolving collection of human relations that's shared and expressed over the years. And you and I, we are not static things. We're complex creatures with physical and psychological and social behaviors that also change and evolve over the years. So long ago, Anaximander insisted you can't understand life just by studying things. Rather, you understand life by studying change. Life in action, as it were. That cloud is not something that you capture in a photograph. It's the changing relation of water vapor as it condenses and rises and then falls back to the earth in rain. And you and I are not something captured in a one-time photograph. We're living beings, moving, interacting, stumbling, and then getting up again, evolving creatures, or in the faith context, evolving children of a loving God. Now I share that because that's why the starting point for thinking about Jesus isn't some portrait of Jesus on the church wall or some static doctrine about Jesus Christ found in a theology textbook. The starting point must be the living Christ, the one whom we've encountered by God's grace, however dimly or partially. But more importantly, it's the one in whom we live our lives. And see, that's what Paul was trying to get across to the church in Colossia. He's put it as simply as he could. He said to them, live your lives in Christ. Be rooted in him. That means in him, in Christ, we find our story And by his grace, we exist. Paul says, be built up in him to follow his example, to grow and interact with others in a Christ-like manner. Be established in him amid a pandemic, knowing that we have fallible and fragile bodies. We find something to trust and believe in, in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. See, From Anaximander, we understand that life is not about static things, but about change. From Thoreau, we're convicted that we're to live each day deliberately, confronting the essential facts of life so that when it comes time for us to die, we will not discover that we had not lived. And then from Paul, we're encouraged to profess the good news that the fullness of life's meaning, even the fullness of God, dwells in Jesus, the living Lord. And not that we can ever simply grasp and contain all of that mystery, but rather it's something that we live into, walk with Christ into a fullness of life that is only possible with him. See, friends, isn't that the ultimate message of Christmas? It's not about things, but about actions, a life grounded in love. It's not about presents and price tags and packages. It's about the placing of a gift in someone else's hands and wishing them well. It's not about things we can count and tabulate like gold coins locked away in grumpy old Scrooge's safe. Rather, it's that image of a giddy old Ebenezer flinging wide the curtains on Christmas Day sending a turkey to long-neglected Bob Cratchit and admitting he's an old fool who finally is willing to go to a Christmas dinner with his nephew Fred. The Christmas story in the Bible is the same way. It doesn't want us to spend our time focusing on decorations and creches and cards. It wants us to actively imagine an angel coming to Mary as a young girl and shepherds leaving their fields traveling to a stable and magi moving over the distant terrain to a new place guided by a star, and then Joseph and Mary holding a child who would change and grow just like us and become the living representation, the fullness of God. Advent began four weeks ago with John 1, and then we listened in to Philippians and Luke, 
and Colossians. We've conversed now with old Anaximander and even Mr. Thoreau. But in this pandemic season of uncertainty, listen to how the whole Advent mystery of incarnation pulls us back to where we began four weeks ago, to the good news in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Christ, the world and everything in it came into being. Yet the world did not know him. So he came to what was his own, and to all who received him, who believed in his name, who lived their lives in him, they became children of God. Not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of mankind, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us. And from Christ's fullness we have all received grace upon grace. So trust in this good news. Go now receiving grace upon grace from the living Christ who is with you, beside you, and stays with us even to the end of the age. Thanks be to God. Amen.